Thank you for being here tonight. Um, we'll begin with a prayer. Uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we gather here today under your care and protection. Thank you for your kindness and for your love that never fails. We thank you for those with us and the ones that couldn't come today. Uh, thank you for guiding us, and we ask you to continue guiding us in our thoughts and our actions to bring you glory. Amen. And the Holy Spirit. Um, I would also like to begin um, by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homeland of the Meta people. I will now introduce you to tonight's speaker. Her name is Marilyn Jackson, and she is the Director of Ministry Services for the Diocese of Saskatoon. Before coming to Saskatoon, Marilyn worked in the Diocese of Kuwait and Lampa at St. Anne's Parish in Philippon. She was also the Executive Director of the Northern Pregnancy Care Center in Philippon, and then in Saskatoon Pregnancy Options here in the city. She comes to us with over 20 years of experience in sacramental preparation, and she has a passion for training and the new evangelization. Please help me welcome Marilyn. Thank you very much, Astrid. I'm not going to use the mic. Everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, it's great to be here this evening, and I'm very honored and humbled to be speaking alongside uh, Sister Saul, who you met last week, and Sister Malou, Father David Tumbach, and of course, Bishop Mark. Um, you're going to be hearing from not only different speakers, but the voice of four very different popes over the next few weeks. If you would have told me eight years ago that I would be standing in front of people talking about a papal document, I wouldn't have believed you. <laughs> um, up until 2016, I had never read a papal document in my life. I grew up in a very staunch Catholic family that went to Mass every Sunday and we prayed the rosary together. And unlike Sister Saul, we didn't have, you know, how she had to um, dust the Bible every week. We didn't have a Bible in our home. My old grandma, who um, was born around the 1900s, she had a Bible and she actually read it. So I know that was very uncommon for that time period. So what we did have in our home were eight by ten framed pictures of either Jesus or Mary on the wall of every room in our house. And my mom really liked the royal family too, so right alongside our family <laughs> pictures, <laughs> we had an eight by ten picture of Queen Elizabeth and her family. And when I left home, I often joke um, that when I left home, I knew Jesus as well as I knew Queen Elizabeth. They were nothing but an image on the wall. So, so when I stumbled across Evangelion and Tiandi, it really changed the way I thought of myself as a Catholic. And it was a time of transition in my life and a time of seeking. And it led to what I call my real moment of conversion. So that's my hope and prayer for all of you tonight. If you've come here tonight and you already have a relationship with Jesus, I pray that you will um, deepen the intimacy with him. If you are here tonight and you're like I was and you're you know, a Catholic all your life and you're praying but you're not quite sure about that relationship with Jesus, I pray that you will encounter him through our time together over the next few weeks. So. So that is what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, we're going to explore the key points of Evangeline and Tiandi. Um, the first one is Jesus as the first and greatest evangelizer, the mission of the church, and the Holy Spirit as the primary um, agent of evangelization. Then we're going to look at where we are in all of this in 2023. How do we become authentic witnesses? What are the unresolved issues of today? And how does Evangelion and Tiandi speak to all of that? So before we get into the key points, I'd like you, I invite you to turn to paragraph four in your document. And there you will find three burning questions. And the first one says, in our day, what has happened to that hidden energy 
of the good news which is able to have a powerful effect on man's conscience. To what extent and in what way is that evangelical force capable of really transforming the people of this century? And what methods should be followed in order that the power of the gospel may have its effect? And then a little bit lower, just below that, it says basically these inquiries make explicit the fundamental question that the church is asking herself today. Does the church or does she not find herself better equipped to proclaim the gospel and to put it into people's hearts with conviction, freedom of spirit and effectiveness? So keep in mind, this was written almost 50 years ago. So what do you all think still when you look at this question? Pardon? We're still asking those questions. <laughs> okay. Okay, so how many people here would say that we're not equipped at all? How many people would say we're somewhat equipped? Okay, and how many people would say that we're very much equipped? Yeah, so a few people are saying we're somewhere in between, and I agree with that. So we can't say that we're not equipped at all, but we're certainly not where we should be. So Evangelion and Tiandi, which is Latin for evangelization in the modern world, was written by Pope Paul VI in 1975. In 2013, Pope Francis said that Evangelii Nuntiandi um, included words that were as relevant today as if they had been written yesterday. He called it a very full text that had lost nothing of its timeliness. And in another address about evangelization, he called the document that basic point of reference that remains relevant. And yet another time, he went so far as to say, in my mind, the greatest pastoral document ever written to this day. So lots of theologians will agree that uh, Evangelion and Tandy is as relevant today as it was in 1975. Um, so many of the leaders in evangelization still quote it today in their talks, and um, Pope Francis has cited it at least 31 times. In at least on at least 11 different occasions, including 31 times in Evangelii Gaudium, which of course is the joy of the gospel, and you will be unpacking that with Father David in a couple of weeks. Okay, so let's dig in. The first um, whole section of Evangelii Nantiandi talks about Jesus as the first and greatest evangelist. He was the perfect model of humility, strength, and courage, and perhaps most importantly is he equipped so many others to go out and proclaim the gospel. So in paragraph six we read, the witness that the Lord gives of himself and that Saint Luke gathered together in his gospel, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. Without doubt, has enormous consequences, for it sums up the whole mission of Jesus. That is what I was sent to do. These words take on their full significance if one links them with the previous verses in which Christ has just applied himself the words of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord has been given to me, for he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring the good news to the poor. And then, of course, in paragraph 7, it says that Jesus himself, the good news of God, was the very first and the greatest evangelizer. He was so through and through to perfection and to the point of the sacrifice of his earthly life. So Jesus' life on earth was a living example of how to evangelize. He was a witness to his relationship with his father. He talked uh, many times about the kingdom of God and the good news of salvation, both through words, through his preaching, and through actions, through the um, miracles that he performed. He wasn't afraid. He didn't avoid the the hard conversations. He wasn't afraid to call a sin a sin and called sinners to repentance. And again, as I said before, most importantly, he equipped so many people to spread the gospel. So if you, you don't have to do it right now, just in your notes, if you want to skip ahead to paragraph 66, it's all about Jesus choosing the apostles, training them, and sending them out. Um, 
So I think it's helpful for us to go back and look briefly at some of the transitional moments in the church. Last week, Sister Saul talked about a, a pivotal moment in the church, but we're going to go back even a little bit further than that. The early church, of course, was the church of the Acts of the Apostles. It was the rise and spread of Christianity. And it was around 250 years, almost half of the Mediterranean was converted. Then came the Church of the Fathers, also known as Patristic Christianity. It lasted about 600 to 700 years. There were a lot of martyrs during this time. And it's the era in which we hear about saints like St. Ambrose, St. Augustine. And then what followed was medieval Christendom. It covered another 500 years or so, and it was the tom time of Thomas Aquinas and Catherine of Siena, which of course they took a more, um, a more intellectual approach to theology. More academic, that's the word I was looking for, more academic approach. And then in the modern era came the Church of the Counter-Reformation. This was about the 1500s to the 1900s. Uh, the Reformation was a religious movement and a, pol and a political challenge to papal authority in Catholic Europe. So it caused a lot of uh, damage to the church and a lot of um, disunity between in Christianity, lots of division among Christians. So the Council of Trent was formed as a reform to the Refor or as a response to the Reformation, and they worked for the resurgence of the church. So some people will even say that it was a precursor to Vatican II. Then, of course, as you heard last week, there was the Second Vatican Council, which happened in the early 60s. So the purpose of this council was the spiritual renewal of the church and the reconsideration of the church in the modern world. So one of the major themes we heard last week was bring up to date. So does anybody remember that beautiful Italian word that Sister Saul used? Mm -hmm. I was hoping Sister Marta would be here tonight because I don't know if I know how to say it. Aggiornamento. Aggiornamento was the word. So this didn't mean that the church's doctrine was going to be brought up to date. It meant that the way we teach, the way we communicate, the way we approach our faith is what was going to change. In paragraph 40, it talks about methods of evangelizing vary according to the different circumstances of time place and culture. So today we talk a lot about meeting people where they're at. Pope Paul VI, 75, or 50, almost 50 years ago, um, was already thinking back then, um, doing this kind of thinking. So another major theme was the universal call to holiness, and we're just going to talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. So finally this brings us up to the Church of the New Evangelization, which is our time, the 20th century up until today. Many people will say that new the new evangelization thinking started with Evangeline and Tiandi, and definitely the foundation of the new evangelization can be found in this document. It was actually Pope Paul, uh, Pope John Paul, the second who coined the phrase, the new evangelization, back in 1983, but the new, evangeliz new evangelization thinking actually started with Evangeline and Tiandi. Okay, so we are going to stop here for a minute. Astrid, I, <laughs> I need your help. Um, I'm going to invite you to answer a question. So this is going to be all anonymous. Nobody will know what you answer. Astrid is going to put up a QR code that you can scan with your phone. If you don't have a phone or you're not a scanning person, just put your hand up and Astrid will come around and help you do that. So the question that's going to go up there is, what is the Catholic Church's deepest identity? So when you scan this QR code, there'll be, um, that question will show up and there'll be a space for three answers. Just one word, if you would like to answer with just one word. You can put in three if you want, but we'll go with one. Okay, does anybody, Astrid, you want to?
Actually, I have my phone here too. I can. What word would you like to enter? Oh, I'm just thinking. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the responses are not coming up, Astrid. The responses are not, okay, here we go. Okay, I'm gonna leave my phone here so you can enter a word when you're ready. So are those responses that people have written on the board and are not following you? So when you're scanning and you put it in, it's gonna... Um, Astrid, can you? But we really don't know who's answering. They're popping up oh, as people are answering. So it's anonymous, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll give you one more minute. Okay. Did everybody that wanted to get a chance? Okay, so in a word cloud, You've probably seen a word cloud before. In a word cloud, the word that is used most frequently comes up as the largest word. So um, a couple that stand out there are evangelization and Holy Spirit. I think you would agree that they're almost the same size, right? And then what else do we have up there? Faith formation, apostolic church, bride of Jesus, sacramentality, authoritative church, suffering church. Apostolic, Eucharist, Universal, Evangelism, so that's just another way to say evangelization. So if that would have been evangelization, that would have been a bigger word. Okay, so all of those things I think we can agree um, answer the question, what is the Catholic Church's deepest identity? So now if I can go back to my slides. Astrid will have to help me. So we go back to our slides. I am going to show you the most quoted uh, passage from Evangeli Nantiandi. This past spring at our diocesan congress, we had three leaders in evangelization doing presentations and all three of them uh, quoted Evangeli Nantiandi. And when the evaluations came in, one of them said, well, it was really good, but there was a lot of repetition. <laughs> And I thought, well, that's good, because that means that you're paying attention. Okay, so one of the most quoted, um, and this is from paragraph 14. Evangelizing is, in fact, the grace and vocation proper to the church, her deepest identity. She exists in order to evangelize. That is to say, in order to preach and teach, to be the channel of the gift of grace, to reconcile sinners with God, and to perpetuate Christ's sacrifice in the Mass. So that's paragraph 14, the most quoted 
um, paragraph in Evangelion and Tiandi, the church exists to evangelize. So that's the second key point of Evangelion and Tiandi, the mission of the church. And the mission didn't just start in 1975. So if you look at paragraph 15, the next paragraph, it makes reference to this. And it goes right back to Jesus when he said this to his apostles. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So that's from Matthew 28. And just a quick note on this. If you, um, oh, I didn't make them bold on this one, but make disciples baptize them and teach them. That's what Jesus told the disciples. So many times in our sacramental prep, we do just the opposite, right? We bring people together, put a name tag on them, teach them everything that they need to know about the Catholic faith, and then we give them the sacraments, baptism or marriage or whatever the sacrament is, and then they don't come back. And we go, oh, what happened? because we didn't do it in the right order. So we make disciples first, then we give them the sacraments, and then we teach them all the great things there are to know about the Catholic faith. Okay, so Vatican II was supposed to foster renewal in the Catholic Church. They thought the idea of evangelization would be more effective in the modern world, but what happened was quite the opposite. Ten years after Vatican II, there wasn't renewal happening in the, in the world. It was chaos and decay. And it turned out that they were naive in thinking that people cared what the church thought. Again, as I said before, my old grandma was born in the early 1900s and she trusted that the church knew what was best for her. So if the church said don't eat meat on Fridays, she didn't eat meat on Fridays. But um, we also have to keep in mind it was the beginning of postmodernism, and that's still pretty much our culture today. So I don't know what we call ourselves now if it's post-postmodernism, but we're still in that same culture today. So also keep in mind, in 1975, the world was, um, the sexual revolution was in full swing. The birth control pill had been developed in the late 60s, and even though the church shocked the world by not getting on the bandwagon with the birth control pill, it was still pretty obvious that people didn't, weren't all that concerned with what the church was teaching. So Pope Paul VI was a prophetic and forward-thinking pope. He had um, a real understanding. He was incredibly in tune with the shift in mindset of the postmodern generation. So he could see that what had been proposed by the Second Vatican, Co Vatican Council was not working, so something had to be done about it. And that December 1975, the apostolic exhortation of His Holiness Pope Paul VI was presented to the episcopate, episcopate the clergy, and to all the faithful in the, of the entire world. And as I said at the beginning, he outlined the mission of the church. He pointed out the urgency of spreading the gospel message. He talked about Jesus as being the greatest and first evangelizer, and he wrote an entire section on the Holy Spirit. So none of that has changed since 1975. So we've been hearing about, I was glad to see that evangelization was one of the biggest words up there. We have been hearing about evangelization for a number of years now and Catholics are becoming more aware of the importance of evangelization, but there's still so many of us that aren't quite sure about the why, what, or how. So Pop, Pope Paul VI told us very, very clearly that the church exists to evangelize. Yet, 50 years later, we really aren't doing all that much, much of it. So let's look at paragraph 10 of the document. There are two key words here, and they are kingdom and salvation. So paragraph 10 says this. This kingdom and this salvation, which are the key words of Jesus Christ's evangelization, 
are available to every human being as grace and mercy. And yet at the same time, each individual must gain them by force. They belong to the violent, says the Lord, through toil and suffering, through a life lived according to the gospel, through abnegation, self-sacrifice, self-denial, and the cross, through the spirit of the Beatitudes, but above all, each individual gains them through a total interior renewal, which the gospel calls metanoia. It is a radical conversion, a profound change of mind and heart. So this basically tells us that the grace and mercy is available to all of us. And back in paragraph 13, it also says, once we receive it and accept it, we must communicate and spread the good news. If we are bec to become followers of Christ and put him at the center of our life, it's going to cost us. So that's basically what it's saying. And to gain grace and mercy, we must experience a conversion. We must have an encounter with Jesus Christ because we can't pass on what we don't have ourselves. And that was me. Back in Flin Flon, I taught catechism for 15 years. I probably saw 300 kids, including my own four, um, come through those classes. And those kids knew all of their prayers. They could name the books of the Bible. They knew the corporal works of mercy, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, seven sacraments, they knew it all. But did they have a relationship with Jesus Christ? No, they didn't because again, I couldn't give them what I didn't have myself. So they were very well catechized, but they were never introduced to a relationship with Christ. So we, before we become evangelizers, we have to be evangelized ourselves. Our missionary life is dependent on our holiness. So our holiness is our interior, our interior life, our personal relationship with Jesus. And we can grow in that holiness through prayer, obedience, repentance, study, what we're doing here tonight. And that's how we become missionary. And it's the uh, responsibility of all baptized Catholics, each and every baptized Catholic. When Jesus told the disciples to go out and spread the good news, proclaim the gospel, he didn't say, well, you know, say it out in words if you're comfortable. No, he commanded them to go out into all of the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. Again, it's hard to pour into others if we're not fed ourselves, right? Okay, so in paragraph 21, it says that uh, being a witness to the faith is the initial act of evangelization and the following paragraphs, it goes on to describe what that looks like. I would just like you to look at paragraph 24, and it's about the third paragraph down. And it says, evangelization, as we have said, is a complex process made up of varied elements, the renewal of humanity, witness, explicit proclamation, inner adherence, entry into the community, acceptance of signs, apostolic initiative. So those are all of the the elements of evangelization listed right there. These elements may appear to be contradictory, indeed mutually exclusive. In fact, they are complementary and mutually enriching. Each one must always be seen in relationship with the others. The value of the last synod, and they're not talking about our synod that we just, <laughs> that just happened, this was the synod in um, 1974, was to have constantly invited us to relate these elements rather than to place them in opposition to one another in order to reach a full understanding of the church's evangelizing activity. So it might help us to understand this paragraph more fully if we have a look at the cycle of evangelization, which shows all of the essential elements of evangelization. Um, and this was a diagram from, uh, what is it called, Michael Dopp, who is the founder of the New Evangelization Summit, and he also has an apostolate called Mission of the Redeemer. So this is his diagram that, that I've borrowed here tonight. So the first one is witness. We witness to the gospel by the way we live, um, how we live in service to one another, and how we live out our faith. And we're joyful when we're a follower of Christ, and that's contagious. We want to be able to, people see how joyful we are, and they want to know how they can have that. The second one is proclamation. 
And this is a step that some people find very, this is the one that people find most challenging because a proclamation means that you actually have to speak words, right? So in paragraph 22, it says, there is no true evangelization if the name, the teaching, the life, the promises, the kingdom and the mystery of Nazareth, the Son of God are not proclaimed. And then lower down in paragraph 27, it says, evangelization will also always contain as the foundation, center, and at the same time, summit of its dynamism, a clear proclamation that in Jesus Christ, the Son of God made man, who died and rose from the dead, salvation is offered to all men as a gift of God's grace and mercy. So sooner or later, we have to proclaim Christ. We have to tell the story of salvation to those who have not heard it. And that's what the new evangelization, that's one of the places that it's directed at, is to people who have not heard um, the story of salvation, and also to invite a response from them to become a follower of Christ. Okay, and then, um, yeah, so you can also, again, like I'm skipping around a little bit, but if you go to paragraph 51, it talks all about um, proclaiming to those who have not heard. So the new evangelization is also a re-evangelization or a re-proposal, and it's directed to those who have been baptized but have fallen away from the church. It's also for uh, people who have been in the pews all their life, coming to church every Sunday, uh, fervent in their faith, living out their Catholic life, but they haven't had an encounter with Jesus Christ. They don't have a personal relationship. So that's the three places that the new evangelization is directed at. So who here, and this is, doesn't matter, you can put up your hand if you want, um, who here has heard of the word kerygma? Okay, so a few people, good. Um, and if you haven't heard of it, don't feel bad because I've been a Catholic all my life and I heard it for the first time about eight years ago. So basically the kerygma is simply the proclamation of the gospel, the fundamental message of Jesus. So there's four, four main, some people use this model, four main points. And the first one is, of course, God created us to have a personal relationship with him now and forever. Our relationship is broken through sin and separates us from God. And then Jesus' life, death, and resurrection redeemed us from sin and restored God's plan. So back to this one, we know, all know what happened in the garden, right, that led to this separation. And then Jesus went to the cross for us. And finally, to accept the free gift of salvation, accept the invitation to follow Jesus. So we all know this story, right? We can memorize these four points. We all know the story. But it's not something we just blurt out to people when we meet them for the first time, right? So that's the, the hard part that, um, that people find hard. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking again for a few minutes. And I'd like you just to have, um, Shauna, maybe you want to move in, move to a table with a few more people. Um, and I'd like you to stay in your table and have a little discussion. And these are the things I'd like you to talk about. Why do you think Catholics do not evangelize? And what is the biggest obstacle to evangelization you have encountered in your parish? Or maybe um, are there obstacles in your own heart? Okay, so we'll give you 10 minutes to do that. Okay, well thank you for sharing. You'll have another opportunity, so if something else comes to mind, just jot it down and um, we're gonna talk a little bit more towards the end. Okay, so let's finish up the cycle of evangelization. So discipleship, once a person has heard the gospel proclaimed and they decide to place Jesus at the center of their life, then the discipleship training begins. And we see that in good catechesis, in a growing prayer life, taking part in Sunday liturgy and entering into a faith community. And as we mentioned uh, Matthew 18 before, make disciples. 
baptize teach, right? So this question of, I heard some of you say um, that fear of rejection or um, we just don't know how, right? And as I said before, it's not something we just meet up with somebody and they go, yeah, you know, I'm really interested in becoming a Catholic. And you go, oh, well, let me tell you the story of salvation. Well, maybe if you have a relationship already, you might say that. Um, but there's a lot of really great reading material out there. One of the ones that I just love um, is by Ran or Andre Renier called Clear and Simple. So this is basically how to have conversations that lead to conversion. And he lays it all out very clear and simple. But again, it's like when, when do we have those conversations? So again, this is also from Catholic Christian Outreach, Michael Hall, um, Intentional Accompaniment and Apprenticeship for a New Generation of Builders. Again, he, I heard somebody talk about um, relationship building. So this is not something we just go and blurt out with somebody when we first meet them. We have to build the trust that somebody mentioned trust. Trust and relationship because evangelization is all about relationship right so these are two really really great books if you're interested in them I can order them for you okay so um, that was discipleship and then of course mission when a disciple grows in a personal relationship with Jesus that's when they become joyful and can't wait to tell everybody about it that's when they become missionary and my favorite story that I always think about of course is the woman at the well so she had that encounter with Jesus and she couldn't wait. Like she just ran to tell people because she was so excited. Okay, so none of this, we can talk about this forever, but none of this we can do on our own. And that brings us to our third key point in Evangelion and Tiandi. So we've talked about why we exist. We've talked about our purpose. We know why we're here. We know why we exist. We have the model of the greatest evangelizer ever to walk on the earth in Jesus. And if you've read the document or you plan to read it, um, the whole middle section is all about how to, just kind of what we've been talking about. Um, and sometimes at this point, so now we're talking about, you know, how do we do this? What does it mean? What are the obstacles? Um, sometimes at this point we can become overwhelmed and go, okay, so we know, we get it, we're supposed to do this, it's everybody's responsibility, but how do we do it? Like, we just still don't know how. Um, we all know the Pentecost story, right? Jesus calls us to mission, but he didn't say, okay, here's your job, see you later, good luck with that. He doesn't say that. Um, when we think of the apostles in the upper room waiting, like they were, they were afraid. It's like, oh, Jesus, we've got this big job. What are we going to do? And then, of course, you know the story, the tongues of fire come and hit them on the head. Well, lucky for them, they had this big sign and they knew that the Holy Spirit was there. But for us, it's like, okay, we know that. We know that story. But how does that happen in real life? How do we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? Um, one of the hard parts, I think, um, about listening to the Holy Spirit is just moving over and letting him actually guide us. And as Evangelion and Tiani winds down, we read this beginning with paragraph 75. The whole last part is about the Holy Spirit. And it says, evangelization will never be possible without the action of the Holy Spirit. So two things I'd like to say about the Holy Spirit. The first one is the Holy Spirit is the primary agent of evangelization. It's the primary agent of parish renewal. Um, it's just a power beyond ourselves that we can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. And the second thing is the Holy Spirit um, ignites our passion. It is our it fuels our desire for evangelization. So in the book of Acts, when evangelization um, began among the Gentiles, a couple of important lessons are there for There's lots of important lessons, but just two that I'm going to talk about. The first thing is when um, the apostles started preaching about Jesus, it, among the Gentiles, among the Jews, it wasn't until the Holy Spirit came upon them did conversion take place. So we know that from Acts of the Apostles. Secondly, is I want to talk about Peter's 
mind, his shift in the mindset and his new ways of thinking. So um, he, Jesus commanded his disciples to share his story to the ends of the earth and the Holy Spirit was teaching Peter that the Gentiles were no longer unclean. So I'm just going to read from Acts 10. Um, while walking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. So Cornelius, who was a Roman um, centurion, had called for him and because he had, he had had a dream too. So he calls for Peter and Peter goes, well, okay. Like <laughs> it wasn't, you know, it wasn't common for him to associate with Gentiles, but the Holy Spirit had been preparing for him, preparing him for it. And he was like, okay, like let's not how I think, but okay, if Holy Spirit says, I will. So anyways, he's there. And he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. So this suggests to me that to be a person of influence, we need to adopt new ways of thinking. And we must always remember that conversion takes place through the Holy Spirit, not us. So that's what the rest of the document talks about, the signs of the time, the persons of the evangelizers. So I was hoping um, Jay and Rochelle would be here tonight. Jay Brockman was here last week. Um, when I started here five years ago, I took a little bit of coaching with Rochelle Brockman and we had a conversation about the Holy Spirit and she gave me this little novena. So I prayed that um, for over and over and over and it really, really helped me to start to listen and start to be aware of the Holy Spirit because I used to think, wow, I really have some good ideas. <laughs> and now I kind of realize, okay, that wasn't me. That definitely was the Holy Spirit. And somebody else that taught me a lot about the Holy Spirit was our parish priest. He said, if you're going to listen to the voice of God, you have to have a sacred place to be able to do that. And then he revealed to us that his sacred place was his bathroom. So I thought, oh, okay, good, because <laughs> that's my place too, and I'm not the only one that <laughs> listens to God in the bathroom. But when I'm getting ready in the morning, that's, those are the times that I'm still and I can really hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. So one, um, it was one morning I was getting ready for work and I heard um, a message so powerfully, deep in the depths of my heart, I can't, it wasn't a big booming voice or anything, it was in the depths of my heart and it was affirmed so many times throughout my day that I actually started to take notes. But this is what I heard very clearly. I was praying for my daughter, um, for her conversion. I pray for the conversion of my children all the time. But I was praying specifically for a struggle that she was going through at the time. And this is what I heard. Um, I heard, look after your own wounds first. Quit, stop trying. Um, stop taking the weight of the world on your shoulders and stop expecting perfection from any, everybody. And I was like, whoa, that's, that's a lot of big stuff. There was a lot of stuff, um, other things that were happening in that time. So I left for work feeling pretty shocked, but it also helped me to start looking. I was like, wow, this was a really big message. What else am I going to hear during the day? So when I got to work um, during coffee break, one of my colleagues shared her personal story and I couldn't believe my ears because it was the same struggle that my daughter was going through. So this is what she said. These are the notes I scribbled down after that conversation. She said, let God carry you in the palm of his hand. His love is greater than anything you will ever know. Love your people unconditionally, no matter what. They are not the ones who will make you happy. Only in God will you find the peace and love. You will become a better person 
in the process, your people will never open up if they don't feel safe. Then later that day, I was watching a webinar by, led by a young Indigenous man, and again, I was feverishly writing notes. This is what he said. Make time to understand. Hang out with people who see potential in you. Watch how you talk to people. The power of words uplifts or brings people down. People will start to feel good around you. You will contribute to making the world better. And this one really blew me away. If you're working in your giftedness, people will feel good around you. And this was shocking to me because my husband and I had just finished taking the called and gifted workshop to discern our charisms. Program yourself to stop and ask yourself what's going on here. And this one really hit me hard too. Forgive people on the fly. When they walk in a room before they hurt you, only accept goodness, leave everything else behind, do this for yourself. When you start unpacking the backpack, the heavy stuff you carry, you become lighter and then your foundation is able to shine through. The power of understanding each other is to create allies. So all of this, I got all in one day and I wrote it all down in a letter to my daughter and I wasn't quite sure how I was going to describe hearing the Holy Spirit. So she is a corporate leader and I thought, okay, she will relate with Simon Sinek. So Simon Sinek is an author and a speaker, and he has a presentation. If you Google it, the Golden Circle, Simon Sinek, he has a five-minute video that talks about the why, what, and how, and how successful organizations, when they know their purpose and they know why, you know, blah, blah, blah. So that was a whole thing. But in this talk, he talks about the limbic brain, and that's... Uh, a place in your brain that has no language, but it's a place where you just know. So I thought, okay, she will be able to relate with Simon Sinek because he's a business guy, and that was the closest I could come to explaining to her how, how to hear the Holy Spirit. So she said thank you for the letter and never talked about it again. And then 10 months later, she sat at my kitchen table and she said, you know, Mom, I, these are the steps that I have taken to heal my own wounds and this is what I'm doing and um, I've been ba able to communicate with my husband better because I'm working on making a safe place for him to talk. So none of this came from me alone. I'm, I'm not that wise. I certainly don't have the audacity to write that kind of letter. All of this was from the Holy Spirit and I don't get that <laughs> every day. I get you know little bits and pieces here and there but it really helps me to be listening all day long. And some days I get nothing because either I'm distracted or I'm just not listening. So again, two reminders. We will not be able to affect change in our world or in our parishes if we don't rely on the Holy Spirit. And the culture of our parishes cannot change if we don't adopt new ways of thinking. So Evangeline and Tiandi tells us in paragraph 40, and I think I already quoted this one once, um, but it's worth saying again, this question of how to evangelize is permanently relevant because of the methods of evangelizing vary according to the different circumstances of time, place, and culture, on and on. Um, but again, when we're you know, reading books of how to do this, it's meeting people where they're at means listening to their stories. Right before we get into the charisma, maybe it happens right away, but listening to their stories, building that relationship. So when we run out of fuel or we run out of passion for this journey, it means that we're trying to do it alone. So it means we have to turn back to the Holy Spirit and get out of the way and let him do his thing. All right, so just to uh, wrap it up this evening, uh, we're going to talk about some of the unresolved issues that remain after almost 50 years. And we're going to go back to the questions that we read at the beginning of Evangelion and Tiandi. In our day, what has happened to that hidden energy of the good news which is able to have a powerful effect on man's conscience? And to what extent and in what way is the evangelical force capable of really transforming the people of this century? Okay, so just a few closing thoughts. Um, in my parish, we're working on um, parish renewal right now, and our parish priest talks about owning 
the mission. So I think exactly what you're saying is we need to make a conscious decision to own the mission because it is our responsibility and we're not, we're not doing, we're not taking that seriously. Some of us aren't taking that seriously. Some people are. Um, so owning the mission and I think part of owning that mission and um, I don't know if it's an issue but it's a reality of today is that so many Catholics don't have that personal relationship with Christ. Bottom line, I think that that's what's happening. And the pandemic is probably one of the greatest examples of what's happening in our church, what's happening in our world, because there's so many people that haven't returned to Sunday Mass. And why is that? Is it because they weren't madly in love with Jesus? Was it because their parish wasn't a place of belonging? Because if they were, I would think if they were in love with Jesus, how could they stay away? How could they stay away from the Eucharist, right? Okay, um, so when we're working in our parishes and um, doing our different ministries, everything that we do, all of our um, activities that we do, we should pass through the lens of evangelization. We look at all of our activities and we have to ask ourselves, okay, is this bringing people to Jesus? Is this activity helping people to deepen their relationship with Christ? If the answer is no, then we have to either stop doing it or we need to make some big changes. And that's a really big challenge for people because we're so attached to the way that we always do things, right? So again, back to Peter, we need to have that shift in mindset. We have to adopt these new ways of thinking. So last week, Sister Saul told us that Pope John the 23rd said that he was opening the window so that fresh air would carry off the dust that had accumulated. And she suggested that the dust is old ways of thinking. So that's our challenge tonight, is brush off the dust that's holding us back from proclaiming the gospel. And of course, Jesus didn't, hasn't left us alone to do this all by ourselves. People are seeking relief from the heaviness of everything that's going on in the world today. And all of us in this room, we have the solution. It's Jesus Christ. Thank you. that our ne uh, the next session is Wednesday again here at the same place at 7 p.m. and you'll be Bishop Mark um, and once you complete uh, all five sessions you'll receive a certificate as well just a reminder uh, and thanks again for coming and I'll see you next week <laughs>